Good afternoon and good morning to you if you are on the West Coast. My name is Jose Leon. I am the Chief Medical Officer at the National Center for Health and Public Housing, NCHPH. Welcome to this live webinar, Building Resilience in the Midst of a Pandemic, What Healthcare Workers and Leaders Can Do During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Thank you so much for attending this activity. I am very pleased to have um, a health center uh, from San Diego, California, La Maestra Health Center, and three great uh, staff members who are going to join and, and discuss with us their experience dealing with the uh, pandemic in San Diego, uh, California. And I am very pleased to have Elizabeth Guroff as well from the National Council for, uh, for Behavioral Health. Uh, this is a, uh, next slide. This is a live uh, activity. At this moment, all lines are muted. Uh, we would like to uh, encourage all uh, participants to please uh, interact with us and make this activity interactive uh, as much as possible. Um, we can use the chat box. You can either type any questions or comments, or you can also use the raise hand icon and your line will be unmuted. At the end, we are going to have a Q&A session in case you have any additional questions for the uh, panelists. At the same time, uh, this was in the beginning a 75 minute webinar, but based on the uh, feedback that we have received from the uh, participants, um, the registrants, uh, we have increased the time. So the length for this webinar is 90 minutes. In case you cannot be uh, on the line for 90 minutes, please leave your uh, questions or comments. So you, again, you can either use the chat box or you can use the uh, raise hand icon. Next slide. Uh, we are the National Center for Health and Public Housing and we provide training and technical assistance to health centers um, with an uh, emphasis on health centers located in or immediately accessible to public housing. Next slide. As you may know, there are around 1,400 FQHCs around the nation. Um, in 2018, they serve over 28 million patients. In the same year, uh, 2018, 385 health centers reported to be in or immediately accessible to public housing and 4.4 million patients. And 107 health centers received uh, funding from HRSA to provide uh, healthcare services to those living in public housing. And in 2018, they serve over 800,000 patients. Next slide. Uh, this is just an overview of public housing residents. There are around 2.2 million uh, uh, residents in public housing. 58% of them are children, 59% uh, are female, 52% um, uh, are white, 45% African American, 25% Hispanic. And uh, this is very important. And 58% of the households report to have at least one person with a disability. Next slide. And why is this so important? We know that the COVID uh, or COVID specifically is affecting uh, everyone. I mean, nobody is immune to the uh, condition, but um, based on the reports that we are getting, those with uh, chronic medical conditions are more likely to have COVID-19 and experience severe symptoms. And if you look at this graph, you see that those living in public house housing are more likely to have asthma, COPD, diabetes, a disability, be overweight or obese, and they reported to have uh, fair or poor health. In addition, um, those living in public housing are more likely to smoke when you compare it to the general population. Next slide. This is a recent study uh, in Wuhan, China, and there was a poll where uh, they uh, tried to interview uh, 1,830 1, um, healthcare workers, and the participation rate was 
almost 69%, 68% of them were nurses and 32% were physicians. And they reported the following uh, psychological symptoms, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and distress. That's why we believe this is a very timely and important topic to discuss with all of you. Next slide. This is a numbers, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, these are numbers taken from, uh, from um, what health centers are reporting right now in, re uh, in regards to, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what we have done is just to analyze data that is from the uh, public housing primary care grantees. If you have any questions or if you would like to access these uh, numbers, please visit our website www.nchph.org. Next slide. And it's my honor and such a great pleasure to introduce our uh, speakers for today's webinar. First, we are going to hear from Elizabeth Guroff. Uh, she's the Director of Trauma Informed Services at the National Council for Behavioral Health. And we have um, three great staff members from La Maestra. We have Dr. Javier Rodriguez, Chief Medical Officer, Sonia Tucker, Chief Quality Officer, and Sofia Daluz, Director of Nursing. So without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to Lisa. Good afternoon, Lisa. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so before we get started into today's webinar, as you guys noticed from those numbers, 70% of our healthcare workers on the front lines are experiencing some level of distress. And we know that that is the nature um, when we're in crisis and when we are dealing with the trauma. So what we want to do first is do um, two activities briefly to just help us uh, regulate, decrease our distress, um, so that we can really focus and engage over the next 90 minutes. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, we have a um, slide that we're going to share with you, the next slide, um, that has a slight meditation. Um, so if everyone can just get into a comfortable position and follow uh, Deepak Chopra's directions. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, it seems that we don't have uh, sound. Uh, can you just recheck the video, please? Sure, give me one moment. Now we're going to do something very interesting. Here we go. No, 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 no sound. Uh, today again. So why don't we, um, if we can pause that video, I will guide us in just a relaxation. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Um, okay. So if we can, yeah, pause that slide so that it doesn't keep jumping in. Sometimes with technology, it's difficult to hear uh, your videos online. So if everyone can close your eyes, sit comfortably with your feet flat on the floor and your spine straight, relax your whole body. Keep your eyes closed throughout the visualization and bring your awareness inward without straining or concentrating. Just relax and gently flow, follow the instructions. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. 
Keeping your eyes closed, think of a person close to you who loves you very much. It would be someone, it could be someone from your past or your present, someone still in your life or who has passed. It could be a spiritual teacher or guide. Imagine the person standing on your right side, sending you their love. That person is sending you wishes for your safety, for your well-being and happiness. Feel the warm wishes and love coming from that person towards you. Now bring to mind the same person or another person who cherishes you deeply. Imagine that person standing on your left side, wishing you wellness for your health and happiness, and feel the kindness and warmth coming to you from that person. Now imagine that you are surrounded on all sides by all of the people who love you and who have loved you. Picture all of your friends and loved ones surrounding you. They are standing, sending you wishes for your happiness well-being, and health. Bask in the warm wishes and love coming from all sides. You are filled and overflowing with warmth and love. Now bring your awareness back to where you are. And imagine one person continuing to stand on your right side. Begin to send the love to the, that you feel back to that person. You and this person are similar. Just like you, this person wishes to be happy. Send your love and warm wishes to them. And, follow, and repeat the following phrases silently. May you live with ease. May you be happy. May you be free from pain. May you live with ease. May you be happy. May you be free from pain. Now focus your awareness on the person standing on the left side of you. Begin to direct the love with, um, within you to that person. Send all of your love and warmth to that person. That person and you are alike. Just like you, that person wishes for a good life. And repeat the same phrase silently. Just as I wish to, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you live with ease and happiness. Just as I wish to, may you be safe, may you be healthy, may you live with ease and happiness. Now picture another person that you love, perhaps a friend or a relative. And this person like you wishes to have a happy life and send them warm wishes as well repeating the following phrase silently. May your life be filled with happiness, health, and well-being. May your life be filled with happiness, health, and well-being. Now expand your awareness and picture the whole globe in front of you as a little ball. Send warm wishes to all loving, living beings on the globe who, like you, want to be happy. Just as I wish to, may you live with ease, happiness, and good health. Just as I wish to, 
May you live with ease, happiness, and good health. Now gently take a deep breath in. And hold it. And breathe out. One more gentle, deep breath in. Hold it. And breathe out. And notice the state of mind that you feel after this meditation. When you are ready, you can open your eyes. So it's a reminder, um, I'm sorry the video didn't work, but a reminder that we are in the midst of crisis and chaos, and we need to take even a couple minutes during, during the day to recenter and recharge ourselves. Uh, next slide. So the next thing I want to do is, is to take an activity from Brene Brown, and for you guys to think about what do you need to do, give yourself permission to, to be present and focused for the next 90 minutes. So if you want to take a piece of paper out in front of you, um, you know, I know that I am at this point working from home, as many people are. I have three children on the other side of the next door, um, a couple dogs who aren't always aware of working hours versus, you know, when they have their needs and they need things done. And so I know for myself, to be present, I need to give myself permission to not be mom, to not worry about all the emails flashing up on my screen, but really to be able to put that away and stay focused um, in the next couple, you know, in the next 90 minutes. So do we have, a, if you're comfortable, kind of sharing in the chat box, um, we can read and share a couple of those as well, of just what do you need to do for yourself? What permission do you need to give yourself to be present for the next 90 minutes? So if any of the presenters want to share or if we have anybody um, who's put anything into the chat box that we can share. Do you see any uh, comments today on the chat, the chat no, box? Not at the moment. Lisa, can you share over yes. here, Lisa? For me, um, my permission is I need to put my cell phone away so that I can be present. <laughs> so I'm, Thank I'm you. putting it away. However, I have to give a shout out to some of our staff who is also in the webinar. That's who they were testing, but I'm going to put it away so I can be 100% here. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we, and this is an activity we can do even after the crisis during our, you know, to start off our meetings because we all have so many things we're responsible for outside of whatever our current meeting is. Um, and we're going to talk today about what are lessons that we can learn now, not just to get through the crisis, but really to be successful going forward. So are, if there aren't any comments in the chat box, I will turn it over. Okay. Sonia. Uh, yeah. So we just had one one response, actually. It was uh, to stay open-minded. Thank you. Yeah, really important. All right. So now um, Sonia, I'm going to transfer it to you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, Doctor, for you know having this webinar. I think this is very important. Um, okay, uh, this is very important because I think we all are trying very hard to serve our communities and still keep our sanity, if you will. So we're going to try to kind of give you guys an idea. Uh, I think we have about 30 minutes. And uh, so I have uh, Sofia, our director of nursing, Dr. Rodriguez, our chief medical officer, 
uh, and we just want to give you an idea of what is that we did um, to respond to the crisis of uh, COVID-19 and, uh, you know, lessons learned and all the work that we have put a little bit more on the work side, but and then towards the end, we're going to talk about also, um, you know, what have we seen within our patients as well as our um, staff and how this has definitely played an important part on the mental health of everybody. So uh, let me see if I'm able to get this uh, perfect. So, um, so this is basically what we're going to be talking about. We're going to uh, try to uh, go over that this content. So what was the action plan that La Maestra uh, put in place? Of course, this action plan has been a little bit, a little bit no, very flexible. We have reviewed this action plan, if not in daily basis, at least every other day. We have put protocols together. What are our challenges, as well as the services that we still keep providing? So. If for the interest of time, and we want to make sure that we make this uh, as a conversation. We don't want to just, you know, have it as a presentation and a lecture. We just want to kind of, uh, you know, talk about it. And maybe Dr. Rodriguez, if you want to give us an idea on, you know, what was our uh, response and how we did it, what did we do? And so kind of just, you know, go ahead and tell us what, what, what we did. Well, thank you, Sonia um, and Sophia. Um, first of all, let me uh, let everybody know that Sonia and Sophia have been the, the champions here, uh, pretty much running the whole show for our entire organization, but particularly here at our, at our Fairmont site here in uh, San Diego, California. This site here um, is probably one of the most diverse regions in the country, as uh, Dr. Leon would know and agree with me. Um, in this area here, it's very densely populated. There's about 60 to 70 languages spoken. Um, it is a one of maybe six or seven known uh, and recognized uh, immigrant uh, and uh, refugee uh, relocation areas. So um, we do see a lot of uh, different uh, ethnicities, cultures, religions, languages, as I mentioned already. So, um, so of course, we were uh, concerned from the beginning when this when we when this started catching wind in late December, January. I started presenting to the board of directors like, hey, um, we're going to be having this coming by, so we're going to have to be ready. Um, we had something similar when the Ebola uh, crisis, and I believe in 2014, happened. And so we, we had a similar uh, workflow and action plan, which basically is that we, uh, we, um, we ended up uh, setting up screening stations where we have limited uh, access uh, of point of entries for patients and staff so that we can, you know, give them a questionnaire as you saw here. And then depending on some of the answers of the questionnaire, that's what our policies and our, and our protocols kind of dictated what we were to do. And like Sonia said, it had to be very flexible because um, as previously mentioned by Elizabeth, uh, we, all our staff went through all those phases, the fear, the anxiety, uh, the depression, you name it. Um, and so that actually helped dictate a lot of our policies. And it's better now that we have a, a, a better firm handle on what we're doing here. Uh, but in the beginning, it definitely was a lot of uh, moving parts, a lot of flexibility, and a lot of camaraderie that we have been sharing amongst each other. And, it, and I think it's really brought us closer together as, a, as, a, as an organization, as a, uh, as a service partner, if you will, with the county, the city, the state. So like Sonia said, we're, we've kept our doors open, you know, but we've had to do them in a way that's not business as usual. And I think that's pretty much everywhere we're seeing across the country. This is not business as usual. So hence, you know, some of the trepidation, you know, that we're you know, feeling from staff, you know, and patients alike as well. So um, those are some of my initial thoughts. Um, I'll be definitely here chiming in as well. Uh, Sophia, do you have anything as well to add? It, 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 I just want to add that it's been a very uh, fluid situation. Uh, we are updating our protocols daily depending on the needs of the community, depending on the needs of the staff, uh, trying to keep um, local law enforcement, county public health recommendations in place as well. So it's, it's ever-changing. Uh, every day is different for us, especially with our um, diverse population that we serve. Yeah. So, um, you know, to continue, this is a basically kind of like, uh, I'm a little bit of a uh, protocol uh, presentation kind of person. So, 
this is what we put together. We have changed this uh, protocol that we have right here, this, uh, this uh, graphic, about nine times. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so just because we want, the main reason being here is for us to give our staff a peace of mind. It is a very stressful situation. So what we want to do is we want to give them the tools for them to be able to feel safe at coming to work. So as uh, so we're going to talk about what are what have been the barriers or you know the problems that we have had through uh, through time. So we're going to definitely talk about a little bit of HR, uh, mental health, and so forth. So we also put together uh, part of so this is basically how it works. As you guys can see right here is um, the screening form. The screening form is applied to everybody or all the patients that are coming into the facilities. Um, and that, you know, for our staff, we created something that will give them the opportunity to see, okay, where are we going to send this patient, even though, um, you know, they might not have 100% medical background because we are utilizing all the staff that are able to work. So PSRs are sometimes at the front, so we needed to give them a little bit of information as well as a peace of mind. However, little by little, we were able to realize that we needed a little bit more um, medical background uh, from staff. And so that's why Sophia graciously has been able to give us an RN that will be at the screening of uh, at the screening front. This has helped us because the anxiety that we are seeing, not only within their staff, but with our patients, has been increasing as the time has gone by. So we have been able to address, uh, in many cases, anxiety um, cases where they came for one uh, chronic condition or and then they ended up in mental health because we needed to address that. So as you guys can see, we have been working very, very tirelessly uh, writing protocols. So what are the best ways? And these are just, you know, examples of protocols that we have been putting together. The whole idea has been to give guidance to the staff that were not foreloaded or that, did, that is still working in um, the clinic, so they knew exactly what to do and they had something to refer to. So, Sophia, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about the usage of the personal protective equipment. This is something that has been in place, and uh, so go ahead, Sophia, talk about the, uh, what we have uh, experienced. So, um, being that the, na the nation is experiencing shortages, um, we, what we put together was a protocol defining what protocols, what personal protective equipment is needed per job do, uh, title. Um, I know there was a lot of anxiety and people, uh, everybody wants to wear an N95. Well, we had to define how we're going to distribute the, the supplies that we have, making sure that everybody's protected. Um, we've had to tell some staff, you know, I'm sorry, but we're reserving the N95 for people that are really on the front line. So. Again, we did categories of the, the job titles and then determining uh, what PPE would be allocated to them, giving priority, obviously, to the people that are doing the actual patient care and patient testing. Um, changing ever so uh, daily, as you know, we've had to update the protocols and then maintaining an eye on the inventory that we currently have uh, to make sure that everybody's given the appropriate uh, protection so that they, we can perform and see our patients. So going back to uh, the mental health portion of things, I think this is important. I was sharing it before the webinar with uh, Dr. Leon. Um, I think one thing that La Maestra has done right, um, well, uh, we've done a lot At of least things. it works for us. So it works <laughs> yeah. for, us. Uh, for us is we have uh, decided to um, put together or mandate uh, uh, the wearing of the mask for everybody that is within the facility since April 20th. So, um, and that was something that we did because we noticed the anxiety of a lot of people working as well as the uh, patients coming in. So anybody that works, that walks into the facility, whether you are a patient or an employee, you should be wearing some kind of face mask. So whether it's a surgical mask or one of the homemade masks, cloth mask. or a cloth mask if you are a patient. And if they don't have it, so we're able to provide some of that. And I have to say, I have to give a big shout out to um, the rest of our staff because uh, our, you know, recruitment team as well as our um, development team has worked entire hours and days to make sure that we get the right 
PPE in the right amounts to be able to do this. Is it perfect? By no means, but we are definitely working towards um, making sure that everybody has what it needs and also educating the staff that is Sophia's and Sophia's team, where we are able to educate the staff what how safe it is to have a regular mask and N95 and so forth. And thank you so much, Sophia, for that. And I just want to uh, circle back a little bit to the beginning where um, when once this whole effort began and the response began uh, towards the end, uh, middle sorry, about middle of March, end of March, that um, we did uh, establish telework uh, uh, policies for our administrative staff. So we have very minimal uh, administrative staff coming you know, to uh, the site. A lot of them are working from home uh, or remotely, and that's been very helpful in terms of reducing the amount of exposures as well as the need for PPE. Um, we do a lot of, just like right now, a lot of phone conferencing, uh, webinars, um, Pretty much phone conferencing. I don't. I think a lot of people like uh, like the phone better than the video. Um, I do as well too. Uh, but today, you know, is an exception, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to you know give a shout out you know to our also our executives um, that you know, they've been very uh, very supportive of this whole effort. Uh, Dr. Leon knows our chief uh, executive officer, Dr. Marcelian. She just received her PhD recently, so. Um, that's wonderful in healthcare leadership. So they've been very supportive of all our efforts here. So um, Sonia, go ahead. Uh, just wanted to give that little yeah. shout out and plug. Uh, on the, in regards to the protocols, it has been something that we also have worked. So this is an example of the protocol that we have um, with, in regards to testing and treatment. We do uh, follow uh, CDC guidelines. Um, however, in our case, we have a very unique uh, population. So we're very mixed. We're very uh, diverse, so that's something that those are things that we have to take into consideration. We have a lot of social determinants of health, as you guys can see behind me. It's our circle of care. This is how we address social determinants of health. This is not about a virus only. This is about, you know, do you have access to care, and if so, how? So we, those are areas that we have to take into consideration that uh, doesn't necessarily uh, are not clearly address in all the different protocols and guidelines that are out there. So this is some this is an example of yes, we have um, uh, we have just personal age, uh, we have any chronic conditions, but also we're taking into consideration social uh, social determinants of health and uh, social issues that would allow us to uh, make a decision if we, you're going to be one of the um, patients that needs to be screened. Ideally in the perfect world, We'll go on universal screening. However, we're not quite there yet. Uh, even though we have been um, we have been increasing the number of screenings as the time goes by, there is more capacity. Okay. Uh, and Sophia, this is one of the protocols that uh, she has put together in regards to um, uh, you know coronavirus and. Uh, patients uh, that you know testing and whatnot so can you talk about it and also on the social uh, distance protocol um, so it was a health order that was recently sent by the county of San Diego where we had to meet certain requirements especially since we're continuing to see patients uh, we had to increase sanitation and we had to be specific as to how we're disinfecting and maintaining the facility safe for the people that are coming uh, this protocol has been updated, I would say, weekly, if not daily, um, and it changes by the day and by the need. Uh, we identify an area that needs to be repaired or, or corrected, and then we would work on it. So, uh, again, following health orders and, and local uh, agencies, regulating agencies, that's what, what we are basing our protocols under and making sure that we're following all the recommendations. So keep in mind that every time we update a protocol, we also inform our executive team as well as our board of directors. Our board of directors has been uh, very supportive, very well informed on all the different activities that are being taking place in the different areas where we are. And each site is a little bit uh, unique, so not it's not one size fits all. We definitely are uh, making sure that these protocols are able to be scaled down or off depending on where we're talking about. So some of the challenges uh, that uh, we want to kind of talk to you guys about, and I think this is um, also where we um, we kind of talk about stress and anxiety. So um, 
you know, as you guys have heard, PPE was a shortage around the country. Um, you know, United States being one of the most powerful countries in the world wasn't, wasn't ready uh, for this pandemic. Uh, we were not able to um, really have PPE, the, the right amount of PPE uh, that was needed at the beginning. And it wasn't our fault. It just, I don't think we, anybody was able to predict what was going to happen. So again, a big shout out to the organization. I think where, you know, we were able to address this issue because we worked together, because we had everybody hands in. So we were able to acquire some of the equipment that was needed pretty early on. In fact, I'm wearing one of the first uh, type of masks that uh, we were able to get uh, as a, you know, donation. And it had it were it was a life saving direct um, relief. I think. Yeah, direct relief was the one that gave us uh, one of us. But thank you for um, our staff, the ones that applied for the grant, so we were able to have um, to have this kind of mask uh, very early on. In regards to testing, this is not something that we had access, and I think it was in general as in um, country we didn't have the testing that the amount of testing that we were that was needed. So how do you keep? I guess the question was. How did we um, were able to apply the test in the right way? We were we had staff that was um, that was exposed, so that was something that we were also and we're still working very closely with our staff to listen to them. As uh, you know, administrators, we needed to be here. You know, all three of us have medical backgrounds, but we needed to be human beings. We didn't need to be only administrators at this time, and that's one of the areas that we worked on was to be here for them, as well as, um, you know, in staffing and for loading, uh, we, very early on, we had to work with our HR department to um, make very difficult decisions, difficult decisions in regards of who was going to go home, who was going to be able to work from home and who was going to be, who was going to be for loaded according to chronic conditions, uh, reduced revenue, age um uh, you know age restrictions and as well as the kind of kind of work that they were doing so uh, i think our hr department was really good at informing them of their rights and helping them and holding their hand through to make sure that they were able to uh, have that financial security that they need in order to keep going and lastly stress and i want to let sophia talk about that because i think you have been uh you have experienced uh, the stress firsthand not for you, but because you have been in the front, so go ahead and talk, and maybe Doctor, if you have heard a little bit more about it, so go ahead, Sophia. I, I just wanted to mention that having nurses in the front line doing the screenings, has been, we've been able to identify patients who come in complaining of physical symptoms when in reality, when we assess them a little better, they uh, voice out that they're really anxious about the current, what they're watching on TV, how, how much TV they're watching, how it's affecting their finances and their family life, uh, having everybody at home. So as a nurse, I personally experienced two patients that came in who expressed physical uh, malaise, but it turned out to be that it, it was more of a mental um, challenge that they were saying. So they were able to voice that in, in, in their language to myself. I was able to connect them with our uh, professionals in family wellness, which is counselors and family therapists. We were able to connect them that same hour with the phone visit, they were able to talk to somebody, the one patient that left the clinic uh, voiced much relief from just being able to talk to somebody while they were here and we were able to address her physical condition just by having somebody available by phone to be able to counsel them and give them some guidance. And then we, we were able to secure a follow-up visit with them. So we were able to, to provide that care to the people in their language in our facility. Yes, and then from the uh, provider uh, side of things, I'm, I'm, I'm currently an active provider as well, providing services to pediatric and young adult patients. So um, I have seen a lot, you know, just personally, I have seen a lot of problems in the homes, especially with the schools being closed. Um, we've seen issues with domestic violence. I mean, I've seen violence on, of kids on their parents. Um, so I've had to do adjustments in medications, ADHD, start some on ADHD medications. Others, you know, make the adjustments, uh, referrals to our, uh, like Sophia said, to our family wellness unit have increased. The, the productivity actually has increased for the, for the uh, psychologists and uh, the other 
uh, mental health specialists, the LCSWs, the MSTs. Uh, the phone visits have been something of a, of a phenomenon, if you will, and also as well as our telemedicine video options. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, we've seen a lot of stress in our patients and a lot of stress in our staff as well, too. And like I uh, mentioned up above here, um, staffing, we did have to furlough some staff and that obviously was stressful, you know, especially with everyone at the same time applying for unemployment benefits. You know, they've been getting, you know, you know, reimbursements really, you know, late, you know, if you will. Um, so it's been uh, definitely a challenge. And then I have a lot of providers that are uh, 65 or older or chronic conditions. So, you know, we've been trying our best to have them work from home, see patients, you know, over the phone, uh, with telemedicine, but that has also been a challenge in and of itself, too. Um, so we're still doing well, you know, um, regardless of all the the different challenges, you know, there even though there is reduced revenue, we're still able to apply for all the programs that are out there. Um, you know, we don't have to pay the, the, the electric bill, which is huge. <laughs> we can hold off for a little bit on that one. <laughs> but um, things of that nature, you know, that's what our executives are doing. Board of directors, again, like Sonia said, are very supportive and very helpful in these situations. And for everything, you know, we love our board of directors. Um, and we have a meeting with them this Friday, so I'll be able to share and present a little bit of this, you know, webinar as well, too, so I'm happy to be able to, you know, let you guys know about that, but I think um, if we go on to the next slide, I think there's that the one that has the um, the um, the services that we're still doing? Uh, yes. Go ahead, Sonia. So, you know, to complement a little bit more of what uh, Doctor was saying, um, also we have experienced some anxiety and stress even among ourselves. I have to I have to be honest, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm not usually a good sleeper, but now I am even a less sleeper. And uh, I was talking to Dr. Leon, and I was explaining to him that uh, I spend long hours uh, looking at data and doing analysis and, and trying to predict how is this virus going to, this unpredictable virus really going to act within the next two or three weeks. And uh, we have meetings among each other to try to see how and when um, we go back to normalcy, how is that gonna look like? I'm a firm believer that we are gonna have pre-COVID normalcy and post-COVID normalcy, if you will. So this is some, these are the um, things that we're seeing, not only on, I'm sharing my, my experience, but also in the other staff that are working also with us. And, uh, you know, these uh, uh, exercises that I have to say, Dr. Mario Salguero, who is the director for our mental health department, as well as our substance use department, has been able to share some of these meditation capacities and also different resources uh, with our medical directors and our staff. And he, is, uh, he has been really a, a good resource for all of us to be able to adjust to this, um, to this pandemic. So in regards to the services that we're still providing within our facility, so we're still open, we're not closed. Um, it, uh, so we just had to reduce a little bit of the capacity on uh, how is that we, uh, we practice medicine and we uh, provide services. Um, so, you know, as you guys can see, we are still open for family practice, pediatrics, OBGYN services, mental health. And all those um, services have been provided either in person, and by the way, we had to be very, very flexible here because we have some providers that are okay seeing in person and want to see their patients in person. We have other providers that rightfully so because of anxiety and uh, stress, they don't want to see those patients in person even though there is a whole screening protocol. So we had to be okay with allowing all the providers to either do telephonic visits or mm -hmm. telemedicine. So what we had, uh, or virtual business, so what we had done, we had to rapidly evolve our telemedicine um, uh, capacities, which we have done telemedicine for quite some time now, but we had to, in less than two weeks, we had to get, we, we went from three providers having capacity to do telemedicine to 32 providers to have capacity to do telemedicine. And as you guys can see, also some IT challenges, just because everybody in the nation is using um, IT. So, but, you know, little by little, we have seen that the patients, um, as what Dr. Rodriguez was saying, the compliance rates of the patients that are able to get a hold of the provider via telephonic visit or virtual visit has gone up at about 22%. So, 
so that is that has been a very pleasant surprise, uh, I think, to all of us. And that has allowed us to keep giving quality of care to our patients. So in regards to the mental health and substance use disorder services, doctor, do you want to go ahead and kind of, you know, give Yeah, them? so um, our, like Sonia said, Dr. Salguero, who's an addiction psychiatrist, he heads up the, the division there he, uh, of both, you know, so he's their, uh, he's their uh, medical director and I work with him closely. Um, all of our mental health and substance use disorder services are pretty much, I want to say, all telephonic or uh, virtual. Uh, we're still keeping up with the various contracts that we have with our uh, partners in the, in the county and in the state with jails and the police department. So we're still keeping up um, very well. I mean, um, I'm not sure. I think he is Dr. Salguero on. I know he might be able to chat something in and hopefully he can. Uh, he can give a little bit of more of a blurb uh, later on. But, um, but yeah, we've uh, really... Uh, wanted to, you know, shout out to our IT department who, uh, we have one guy, the guy that helped set up earlier right now, Mike, uh, he's the lieutenant uh, next to our uh, CIO and he's just been phenomenal. Uh, like I keep saying in a few emails, he's a younger guy, so I always say, Mike's just killing it, you know, he's just killing it, you know, and most people get that. <laughs> and he's done a wonderful job and it's really helped all of us in all our departments to be able to see patients in this kind of uh, newer frame or newer model. Um, and it's true, like Sonia said, we went from, you know, myself and a couple other providers doing telemedicine to just like everybody's doing some form of telehealth, telemedicine. And I guess the terms keep changing, right, Sonia? Yeah. But, um, but yeah, um, and for substance use disorders, uh, um, we've gone, you know, instead of having to use uh, injections, and Dr. Salguero can maybe chime in a little bit on this, but to oral, like uh, Suboxone and what have you, things of that nature. So we've had little uh, different things where, you know, we work with pharmacy where we have deliveries, uh, curbside to go, kind of like, I guess that was Applebee's in the back in the day. <laughs> At least that's who I remember is, you know, curbside to go, but, uh, you know, everybody does that now. Um, but yeah, so um, if we want to, uh, uh, we can move on from yeah. this slide. Or actually, I wanted to, um, if you can uh, share with us the numbers, Sonia, of the patients. So the, uh, so the numbers, uh, um, so I just to, I don't know if you want to, uh, add anything to no. what we have done. Okay, so um, just uh, because I know for the interest of time, we have to wrap right. up. So telemedicine has been a saving grace, uh, as well as a little bit of a headache, uh, mm -hmm. you know, both uh, both worlds, but you know, we have Very learned how to embrace it. Um, our social services are still open. It has been really good to have social services open because we do have a food pantry. And one of the oh, things yeah. that we're looking at is uh, the lack of food, the lack of nutrition, so not only we have a food pantry, but well, uh, something that we have done is we started uh, giving hot um, lunches to uh, 250 people a day. And at some point, I think we were also doing some breakfast as well. And we had uh, we had partnerships with uh, like Feeding San Diego and the food uh, the food banks uh, so that we can provide that. Since the schools are closed, it's, uh, you know, some of these families really need or depend on the schools to be able to do this. And that was also giving uh, more anxiety and stress to the patients or to the, the community. Food insecurity. Yeah, food insecurity. So we were trying to really meet those gaps. Um, you know, in regards to social services, a lot of people are coming to make sure that they have their application for food stamps for medical because they want to be prepared. They want to make sure that if this hits them, they will be they're able to respond. So we have tested so far 121 patients uh, since March 16th. So we had to be a little bit more conservative with our testing initially. 22 of those patients have tested positive. So that is a little that that is very it kind of hands to the average of the patients that have become positive here in San Diego County as well in California. So the percentage range uh, uh, that we're seeing is about 15, 10, 15 percent. So this, uh, you know, this is a little bit higher. However, I think we're going to start. We're going to start getting a lot more testing done uh, since now we're going to start working with the homeless communities in the convention center here in San Diego, where we are planning to try to test as many people as possible uh, with one provider that um, is going to be willing to do that. So. You know, it's it has been quite of a learning experience for all of us here, and I don't know if you want to add something before. Yeah. We're done, um, so we're um, speaking of the convention center. We're going to be offering primary care services, and we're going to see how much we can also offer in terms of uh, 
medical assisted therapies for substance use disorders. Um, so we've increased our testing capacity. We've been uh, we partner up, or we've always had a relationship with Quest, but especially now we really enhanced our partnership with Quest Labs, and they keep providing us more and more test kits because we're testing the community. You know, um, sadly some other. Uh, providers offices, doctors offices, other clinics even, even community clinics have not been able to test, you know, and, and it's difficult. So we feel for the community and that's why we're here and, you know, we want to be able to serve the community. And um, of those 22 that have tested, some of them had to be admitted to the hospital very ill. You know, they're transferred, but a lot of them were sent home, you know, for the uh, home in isolation and self-quarantine and, you know, self-monitoring. And we're also following up with them every few days telephonic visit to see how they're doing, see if they don't need to be uh, sent over to the ER or have the ambulance called. Um, uh, and so we've been, you know, following up with our patients who are uh, COVID-19 positive. A few that we um, sent that we hadn't tested initially here and then those ended up being positive. Are those in the numbers as well, Sonia? Or? No. No. So that's 22 plus maybe another four or five, you know, that are overall have been positive if you I want to add it to the rate here. But, um, but yeah, we've been... Uh, trying our very best, you know, to keep the doors open and, and we will continue to do that as well. And I think thank that you. is uh, everything I have for you guys. Thank you so much for having yes, us. Thank and, you for having uh, us. And thank you. We look forward, uh, Elizabeth, to hear your part. Yeah, and then we'll take any questions later on. We'll be here the whole time. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I, I am very happy and very honored and very lucky to have three uh, staff members from La Maestra, the CMO, uh, the, uh, the Dr. Rodriguez, and Sonia, and Sofia, thank you. Uh, I mean, uh, that is a great honor, you know, to have three great uh, panelists at the same time on the same call. Thank you, and I'm, now I'm turning it over to, to Lisa. Thank you, yeah, I just listening to everything you guys are dealing with, it's quite a lot for, you know, a couple months and the, all that you're talking about is packed in, I'm sure, every day to what you guys are doing. So thank you for the work that you're doing um, on the front lines. It's so important. Um, what we wanted to also do is to provide everyone with like, what can we do? How can we support our workers? So we want to talk a little bit about the impact um, and look at some strategies that we can do psychologically. Um, to really lessen the impact. My biggest message to everyone is as leaders and as healthcare providers, if we don't take time out for ourselves, and if as leaders we don't provide time for our staff now, we will be looking at a highly burned out staff down the road and a loss of workers, which we don't want to see happen. So as we learn through and practice uh, different things like mindfulness and just, you know, taking a couple minutes here and there. <clears throat> Remember that this is really about not only getting through the crisis, but coming out the other side stronger. Uh, next slide. Uh, you guys will also have access to <clears throat> all of these slides in a PDF at the end. So we're going to go through the information really quickly. Um, but I want you to know that you will have access to these, um, you know, so if there's details on slides, don't worry about getting those down, you will, you will get slides. <clears throat> so recognize, we saw that distress and the increase in anxiety and depression. Anxiety is a normal human response to a stressful situation. And if anyone hasn't figured it out yet, COVID-19 as an pan international pandemic is a national crisis for everyone. We are sitting in the middle of a traumatic experience. Next slide. This gives you some uh, things that are specific to um, COVID-19. Really, and you guys talked about this and what you guys were looking at, right? The chronic condition, the concerns about passing, um, you know, receiving or, or um, having COVID-19, passing that maybe on to loved ones, the change in our daily activities, our inability to maybe help someone that we were helping before who might have a chronic condition. Maybe we were checking in on the loved one more regularly. And we're also, as you guys are noting and, and uh, in the statistics in the beginning, we are seeing absolutely an increase in healthcare concerns. 
um, mental health care concerns across the across the country. And those um, that are even seeing a higher levels of distress are lower income houses and families with language barriers because they don't understand what's going on or they don't have access to the same information. Unfortunately, your, you know, your discussion about uh, the social determinants of health is a huge thing that we need to look at. You know, whether it's children not being able to access school materials, you know, we talk about children on the college level having to go home and study from home, whereas when they were living on residential campuses, it was a level playing field. When they go home, different people are dealing with, different students are dealing with different things. You know, whether we even look at grading versus just giving people the information, that's really starting to really impact our lower income families and it really highlights the importance of awareness of those social determinants. And then we have some groups who are even experiencing some level of stigma, whether it's related to their race or their age or their ethnicity, um, you know, disabilities, or even healthcare workers starting to be perceived as you might have the disease, and so we need to, you know, not only physically distance from you, but ostracize, and we need to be very careful about how people are experiencing this and being sensitive to that. Next slide. This is a slide that gives you really a look at Overall, when we're looking at outbreaks, what can make some of them stressful? Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is these, these two in the middle, the changes in our sleeping patterns um, and the, our eating patterns, and really making sure that our healthcare providers on the front line are able to get enough sleep and a routine during their day that not only has predictability, but also those mental health breaks that we talked about. Next slide. You know, as a, as a consultant, I've been in a lot of rooms with healthcare providers, and on a good day, people aren't getting that eight hours of sleep or having a regular schedule. If I can tell you anything, it's get that in now. Please make sure that during this crisis, you're doing everything you can to take care of yourself and to take those breaks. So here are some ways, um, and I have a couple slides like this for everybody, on different things that we can do for ourselves to start managing our cope and cope with the stress and fear of living through an international pandemic. So controlling what you can. We talk a lot about physical distancing, but I would also strongly recommend that people um, distance from media as well. Take those breaks. The information, the emails, whatever it is, is going to be there in 10 minutes or an hour later. You do not need to sit in front of that TV. And when we do, and we just absorb way too much ongoing media information, it really can make things a lot worse for our own regulatory system. The body that you have now, physically and mentally, is the one you're going to have when you come out of this pandemic. So please take care of yourself as we go through this. Also make sure that you focus on physical distancing, not social distancing. We are, as humans, by nature, social creatures. And we thrive in interactions and relationships. And we find a lot of people finding really creative ways. Zoom happy hours, family game nights, you know, on FaceTime. Please make sure that you're still connecting with those you love, not socially distancing, but really focus on physical distancing. And then just taking care of your mind, body, and spirit. We want to really come out in a post-traumatic growth phase as opposed to a burnout phase because we're exhausted from dealing with the crisis. So being kind to yourself recognizing that all of us might not be able to do a regular eight-hour day that we did before. We find people are more tired, taking naps during the day, needing to maybe work a flexible schedule so that they can attend to the ones that they love or they're, you know, the, if they're helping their children. Um, but really giving more choice and flexibility is really important right now. Um, exercising avoiding self-medicating. We are seeing you know, increase in numbers of alcohol and tobacco use. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're mitigating that because unfortunately, it will numb you in the moment, but it won't give you the resilience to bounce back long term. Um, taking time to relax and taking time to help others. 
Um, you know, I know my, for example, my mother is a volunteer at a hospital. She's not able to do that. So she's home making masks and feeling like she's at least still doing something to contribute. So all of those things are really important. Next slide. The other thing here, um, to just infuse some trauma-informed care principles, these are different ways in which we can start looking at not only how we do things now, but I would encourage you to learn from what you're doing now and take it into the next stages when we start to find our new normal. So prioritize safety, physical, emotional, and psychological. Uh, finding best practices to work remotely. We're definitely talking with a lot of people who have not worked remotely before. And they're finding difficulty in that transition from work to home. So turn the computer off. Have your time where you're working and have your time when you're home. And then find whatever transition works for you that you might not have in your you know, you must, might have had a commute before. You're not having that. Make sure that you find that transition and put work away. Making sure that we're talking about the difficult things, even in team meetings, making time to just connect with each other on a personal level of where you are doing some level of regulating behavior before we move on to the content of whatever our meetings are. Next slide. The next one talks about trust and transparency. I think one of the hardest things right now as leaders is we don't have all the answers. And we're used to being able to take care of our staff and know what's going to come around next. So sometimes just being vulnerable enough to say, I don't have all the answers. This is where we are today. As you guys talked about, right, that rapid cycle of changing of protocols. We're doing the best we can with what we have. And as your supervisor or leader, I'm here today and I'm going to be here tomorrow with you. And I'm going to be here at the end of this as well. And we'll find some of those answers together. Um, because I think right now staff want to know what's going on, but be part of that decision making because the decisions are really impacting their livelihood and their life. And you, you know, it's, it's funny to talk about including HR in the discussions about how to make some staffing decisions that are best for the staff um, first. And that's really who we need to make sure we're taking care of. Um, as leaders over communicating, um, sending more regular check-ins and messages and things like that, and reassigning uh, projects and things as, as needed to make sure that people are able to manage the load that they're um, carrying. Next slide. The next one talks about collaboration and mutuality and really allowing for that social interaction and being present and recognizing we're whole people, not just you know the piece of us that, but that goes to work. So looking for common experiences. Right now I know we're trading at work recipes. Everyone's cooking more at home. Um, you know, sharing pictures of your pets or other ways in which we can connect on a really human level with each other is gonna be very important regardless of you know, what our level in the organization is. Next slide. And then voice and choice. One of the things that we know in crisis is the first thing we lose is the ability to control what's happening to us. So wherever we can infuse that for our staff and for ourselves, we are gonna find better results on the other end. What do we have control over? Where can staff have input into what we're, going, what we're doing? Um, is going to be really, really important. And again, going back to that recognizing our own privileges, you know, whether we do have a job and are able to work from home and some people aren't able to do that, you know. Um, so the impact, it's, we're all going through the same crisis and it's all impacting us on different levels. So giving and allowing space for those discussions is going to be really, really important. Next slide. So this slide for us is um, our trauma-informed leadership slide, and it's our model. And um, in the next, if we can go to the next slide, um, what we're going to do is really focus right now on two areas of trauma-informed leadership. One of them is, if we can go to the next slide, is adaptive leadership, and the other is that section of really fostering supportive environment, recognizing this is not the time for management. It is not the same day every day. 
It is about adapting and, ma you know, that rapid cycle leadership change. And you guys did a great job of talking about, you know, how much you're having to change every day and take in new information. It's kind of that rapid cycling CQI process. Learn from what we're doing now, at least try something, figure out what the lessons learned are, and then adapt as we go forward. And then the importance of fostering that supportive environment for our staff, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Next slide. So the next three slides that I have for you are from the work um, and discussions from um, Dr. Bruce Perry who really informs a lot of our work and understanding of brain development and brain functioning. So this is a reminder, the, the uh, upside down triangle is his representation um, just on a very basic level of how our brain functions. With the colors being where more of our focus and energy is going during a certain time. So on the left side with the neocortex really highly in blue, we have someone who's very calm and emotionally regulated. And what we notice on the other side is an adult who's really in that fight, flight, or freeze space. They're very stressed out. They can't get past kind of that feeling of what do I do in this second, in this moment, or even have a difficult time of even concentrating on the sense of time. And what we know is that if as an adult, we can keep ourselves regulated, we can help regulate those around us, which is so vital in crisis. Because the more we stay in our brainstem, the more we stay in our fight, flight, or freeze space, the less we're going to be able to have really, really um, thoughtful responses to things. Okay, next slide. So these two slides um, are from Dr. also from Dr. Bruce Perry and show the difference in the emotional state whether we're in calm, alert, alarm, fear, or terror. And it, these two slides he has um, with children, but I would suggest they're really with any other human that we're interacting with. If we start in calm on the bottom and we interact with a patient, a coworker who's already in that alarm state, right? The more we stay in the calm and alert, you can see that they start to regulate based off of us. Whereas in the next slide, if you can switch to the next slide for me, it really starts to show how if we start elevated and we continue to elevate with them, that there turns into this explosion where the person that we're working with really ends up in the terror stage and we end up high, much more highly dysregulated. And unfortunately, the higher you go up in this, the less really productive thinking that goes on. So the, if you're not able to keep yourself in that calm state, then that's when I would suggest that you're starting to move into a place where you need to take a step out, regulate yourself emotionally so that we can come back into whatever we're dealing with. And it might be tapping out to a colleague or a co-parent or you know, just saying to the kids, like, I need a break right now, um, because we're going to be more productive when we can come back calm. Next slide, please. The next slide, um, series of slides, is also just how we process trauma. So what we know is that when trauma occurs, our body goes into our sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze response. And when we are, you know, our body, the adrenaline flows, the cortisol in our brain goes, and everything else shuts down to manage our fight, flight, or freeze response to get through the crisis or get through the trauma. In a healthy discharge, our body and our brain are able to go back into our parasympathetic nervous system. So I have a couple slides to illustrate that. So the next slide, so here is our, imagine your parasympathetic, your rest and digest, okay? Next slide is our sympathetic nervous system, that fight, flight, or freeze response when we hit a crisis. And remembering that all of our information comes up through the brain stem. So if it doesn't get past the brainstem, we are stuck in fight, flight, or freeze. So if we go back now to the next slide and, and go back to that healthy discharge of trauma, bad things are going to happen in life, traumas occur, crises occur. We go into our sympathetic, and then once we discharge the trauma, we go into our parasympathetic. And on the next slide, it looks like this. Unfortunately, if we're not able to discharge the trauma, and right now we are in the midst of an ongoing prolonged traumatic stress. 
it starts to look like this next slide. So here we have that red line of the healthy discharge. If we don't discharge trauma, we will notice as humans, we either get stuck in that on or off switch. People who are stuck in on due to, due to toxic stress, childhood abuse, different things that really put your nervous system where it's not able to discharge um, ongoing trauma. You might see someone who's hyperactive, panic, rage, or mania, and if their system gets stuck in off, so those are our fight people. In off, we see our freeze people. And they're gonna, we're gonna see depression and disconnection and exhaustion. And so the next slide is what that looks like. So what I would suggest to us is if we don't find healthy ways to discharge trauma, if you don't take those mindfulness times, get yourself into a routine and a schedule, get regular sleep, this is where our workforce is going to be post COVID-19. Next slide. So what we can do is really start to build on our resiliency. So resiliencies and protective factors are what are going to help us get out of and come and discharge trauma in a healthy way, regardless of whether it's an international pandemic or whether it's a car accident or a difficult situation in our own lives. So really building those resiliency. And this is one of, oh, keep going. This is one of my favorite quotes right now, is to recognize that people are not at home working, that we are, at, we are in the middle of a crisis trying to work from home, which is a very, very different perspective. So making sure that we're recognizing that we're functioning the best we can during crisis, it's not business as usual and we just happen to be working at home. We have our children at home, People have a lot of different things they're managing. If you work, I know in our community, a lot of our stores close early to allow people now, 24 hour stores are closing between six and eight o'clock at night. So if you're working during the day, the rush to get out to the store to get your basic supplies, you know, to get home is a very different pattern and routine than we've had before. Next slide. So one of the things that we can really practice right now when we look at adaptive leadership skills is just active listening. And we're gonna go through this really quickly. Um, again, you guys have these slides, that, um, or we'll get these slides. So next slide talks us really through what active listening is. And really it's the move from listening to, under, listening to respond to moving to listening to understand. Everybody is in crisis right now. And if we go to our old ways of defaulting to listen to understand, to respond, we're not going to give people that chance to debrief and get off, you know, get, get off the message off their chest to us that we need to get. So that next, the next slide talks us through that first place. So reflective listening is just listening with the intent to understand. And it's going to look like this on the next slide. So as the, the speaker is going to tell you what they said, you're going to say what I hear you saying is, is that correct? Is there anything else you'd like to add? If I missed anything, what did I miss? And you're gonna give the, list, the speaker enough time to share all of that with them before you respond. On the next slide, we look at really what the response is. When we're really active listening and not listening to respond, when, after we've repeated back what we've heard, we're only responding to what the speaker shared with us, which means if they didn't ask our opinion, we're not giving it. And if they didn't ask, for, ask those questions, we're not answering it. And so all we can really do is start to become more curious about that person. And what I suggest is when you practice this with somebody, you will help ground them because they're able to just deal with their own emotions as opposed to us interjecting you know, our perspective when it's not asked for. And this in adaptive leadership helps us create that supportive environment and safe place for our workers and staff. Next slide. The next three slides here um, are really just other ways from the um, Anxiety and Depression Association of America that we can use with ourselves and with others. If you can flip through the next two slides for me on how to um, manage on a mind, body, and activity level dealing with anxiety and stress, especially right now when it is prevalent for all of us. 
So you can go back and review those slides, but really that importance of a regular schedule, taking breaks out, these are also other ways in which we can um, really start to engage and give our body that calm time to reset. And again, if we don't, and if we don't provide that for our, our frontline workers, we're going to end up with a burned out for, um, staff, and we're going to have a lot of people in the next year or two where we're going to lose some of our really great staff who have been on the front line because we haven't taken the time in the moment of the crisis to recenter. Next slide. So this next slide is uh, back to Dr. Bruce Perry's work. Um, if you can put all of them up for me, it really just gives us a way to look at those that we're serving as well as ourselves in those different internal states that we referred to earlier. And I would encourage you to look at that, the top and the bottom. So when we're in a certain state, what our sense of timing is. And so if we're talking with or feeling ourselves in anything past calm or alert, recognize that we're not able to process information past either the next few seconds, minutes, or hours, or no sense of time at all. And so if you find yourself at those places, please take time out. Or if you find your staff in those, in those last three um, columns, please allow them time to recenter, to get back to calm, because they are in a place where they're not able to process and really be their best self. We want to give people that opportunity to reset. Next slide. So this slide just again reminds us that when we're in that survival mode, the rest of our brain shuts off in, ability, in our ability to respond, learn, and process, and why that's so important then for those breaks and those moments. Next slide. So this talks about the impact on that lower brain, and we really are talking about bottom-up activities. We're not going to calm someone down by just telling them to calm down, but finding things that can be rhythmic, repetitive, relational, relevant, rewarding, and respectful as a way to engage that lower brain, meditation, drum circles. You know, we've got a little boy down here doing finger paint. Sometimes those arts, rocking chairs, body movement, are what are going to help recenter us. Next slide. This slide gives us information on um, supporting our staff, monitoring secondary traumatic stress. I can't emphasize enough how our workforce is really taking on so much in such a rapid fire period. So making sure that we know what our, threat, our staff's responses look like when someone is moving from compassion satisfaction into compassion fatigue or secondary um, traumatic stress and making sure that we're providing time for them to regroup and take those breaks so that they can come back as their best self. Making sure people have time with their families, media distancing, the importance of that daily schedule that allows for self care, and please connect with people on that personal, reliable, supportive way, because that is what is going to get us through. In our hardest periods of time, it is all about personal relationships, and so with our staff, connecting with them as a whole self is so important, giving them time to talk about what the stressors are at home, what else is going on for them, et cetera. Next slide. This slide really gives us the different areas of resilience, different ways in which we can build up our protective factors and resiliencies to come out of this stronger and in a post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic growth area so that we don't lose our best workers in the midst of this crisis. It is so vital that we understand what those different things are so that we can then, um, you know, really help build those and allow time for everybody to build in these different areas. Next slide. So this is also the importance of reframing, the understanding that things feel like they're happening to us, um, and that the more we can have control over things and move from I have to do this thing to I get the opportunity to do this thing. 
is really important. Um, and one way is down here um, in New York, we have Governor Cuomo, who's starting to talk to people about who are you staying home for? Who are we doing this for? As opposed to I have to stay home, it's actually I get to stay home because I'm part of the solution. Next slide. And then the last um, exercise we have for you guys is there are two journal entries attached to um, the webinar today. One is for leadership and one is just for personal growth. So it really is focusing on today, what was my biggest stressor? What was my biggest success? Um, you know, what can I learn from today? What went really well? And then down at the bottom, a year from now, I want to remember that this is the week that I did X, Y, or Z. I would encourage you to start doing this kind of journaling now so that when things start to slow down from a quality improvement stance, you can go back and remember all of those things that, you know, rapid fire started really changing for you. So that when we go into the future, you have those notes um, to come back to and to review because there are so many incredible things that our staff are doing right now in the middle of this crisis that are innovative, that are, you know, incredible, that we don't want to lose, but we're at risk of losing just because of the nature of being in the middle of a crisis. Next slide. And so this is just to remind everyone that everyone, we're all in the middle of a trauma together, but we all react to that very differently. So make sure you're taking time for your own self and your own community to take a break and the importance of that break to getting through this in a positive way. Also know the facts that help for you reduce your own stress levels and please take care of your own mental health during this pandemic. And then the last slide we have for you are some of the resources um, where some of this information has come from um, so that you can go back um, on your own time and explore that information. Thank you, Lisa. That was a great, great, great uh, uh, presentation. And once again, I would like to uh, thank uh, Sonia, Sofia, Dr. Rodriguez, and Lisa for uh, their presentations. Uh, this has been a great experience for all of us. So we are going to start our Q&A. Um, if you have any questions, again, uh, please use the a chat box, type your question. Uh, if you would like to ask your question verbally, uh, you can use the raise hand icon and your line will be muted. Uh, before uh, we get to the Q&A, uh, also please, uh, at the end of the webinar, there is a, a survey Please complete the survey. Your uh, feedback is uh, really important to all of us and, and it provides uh, recommendations on how to get uh, better training and technical assistance to all community health centers and, and participants. Either do we have any questions? Um, yes, we do. Um, yes. One question for La Maestra. Um, are you making staff assignments that evenly distribute the most stressful tasks? For example, in-person care, a few days followed by telehealth visits for a few days. Uh, yes, we're, so we're doing that. Um, I wanted to uh, actually highlight a little bit of what we're doing with our uh, adults 18 and over that have uh, respiratory symptoms. So here at our Fairmont site, we have a, uh, to the left of me, we have just across the parking lot, we have a detached unit where we're seeing uh, adults 18 and over with respiratory symptoms. And those are the ones that we've either um, referred to the hospital, tested, uh, treated, whatever uh, the, the outcome was, you know, given the provider's uh, evaluation and discretion that we're rotating uh, one, uh, one provider one week as well as our team, and then they're off doing uh, other things for two weeks so that they're not continuously exposed and similarly here at our main site, at this building, um, we have no uh, symptomatic adult patients. Uh, we do have some symptomatic uh, pediatric patients with fever, cough, and cold, but in an isolated capacity with all our disinfection protocols following as well as our uh, staff donning PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. So um, we do have uh, a variety of 
assignments, if you will, um, whether it be MAs, uh, providers, um, even some PSRs as well, too, with uh, them coming in and out of the screening areas uh, as well to do other things, too, like um, we're trying to establish more uh, wellness checks on all our patients, to um, so we're recalling our or we're grabbing lists of patients that we either, you know, have seen in the last six months to a year, and then we're calling them to see how they're doing, and even those beyond one year, too. Sonia or Sophia, uh, anything else? So basically, it's, yeah, we have uh, rotation, so we give uh, the, uh, the staff capacity to, um, you know, kind of uh, relax after being exposed or being in areas that More are higher risk, high, yeah. high, you know, highly stressful. So, that yeah, we're trying to do as much as possible now. Great, thank you so much for, for the response. Uh, do we have any other questions, Peter? Um We do, and we also have a very positive feedback on today's presentation um, from James. Um, he says, look forward to receiving a copy of the slides deck from the presentation by Ms. Girl. The content was very helpful and will be shared widely through the team at my health center in taking home for a simulation by family members as well. Um, so we have another question as well, um, and this one is for Lisa. Understanding that health centers have only limited staff, all of whom are very busy with which to accomplish the health care mission, what activities and practices can health centers implement to prevent or at least mitigate stress for staff? How can these tasks be customized to address social distancing? So a lot of uh, stress relievers are really personal, and I think we'd be surprised at how uh, quick they can be. Simply adding um, a rocking chair or a quiet space for staff alone to just go and recover. Um, if we look back at Dr. Bruce Perry's work on those six R's, you know, music, um, having meditation, being able to practice active listening and just be able to get things off your chest. Um, they don't necessarily need to be in person, um, but we all find relief um, in a couple, you know, in a variety of different ways. And I would encourage people to look at all the different scents and or senses. So, you know, it might be lavender that someone can just, you know, have access to. Some people find. Um, you know, a warm blanket. We've seen an increase right in those weighted blanket uses. Um, and some, you know, I would encourage you to look back at your debriefing policies for crisis. And what do you do to help support staff in your regular business process of crises? You know, um, and how can we start to interject some things? But I would look at the, at the different senses. Are there things they can touch? Stress balls, water beads. You know, different things that can um, really help different people in different ways. Um, but look at all of your senses, and I would look at those six R's from Dr. Bruce Perry. But even just adding a rocking chair and allowing people to just go get back into their natural rhythm is going to be, you know, a quick and easy but vital thing that we do for our staff right now. Thank you, Lisa. Um, any other questions in the queue? Um, and yes, this is for La Maestra, uh, and they want to know if our providers conducting telehealth visits from their homes. Yes, the, they are conducting telehealth visits from their home, um, and uh, it's been a little bit of a challenge. The phone calls are a lot easier than the than the virtual uh, telemedicine with video. Uh, uh, visits. Um, they can be done. Um, we have it set up through our EHR. We have a platform called Auto that we're using. That's part of the next-gen uh, EHR uh, offerings. And we also use uh, utilize WebEx as well, too, to um, dial in and uh, uh, patients and providers as well. And uh, I wanted to actually go back a little bit to the uh, question on the assignments. Uh, and Sonia reminded me, and, and this is true, um, that for the higher-risk areas, like the screening stations, and even the, uh, the adult uh, cold and cough clinic, we call it the CCC here. Um, those are all have been uh, asked, not sent. So we've asked, are you okay with you know working in this environment? You know it's a little higher risk, but you know we're giving you 
the, all the tools to have the most protection you possibly can have. And, um, and they've all said yes, the ones that are working there. So we have three providers right now that have said yes to that, uh, uh, that effort, as well as our MA and uh, um, PSR staff as well. So just a, a good uh, little uh, distinction there. Um, so um, especially for that area where staff feel very stressful, uh, about working in that area, some have not been able to do that, and that's okay. We'll we'll have them work elsewhere where there's less staff, uh, less stress, you know, that the staff you know perceive and feel, you know. So I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, Phil, I believe that we have time for uh, one more question. If there are more questions in the queue, uh, uh, we are going to send the questions to the panelists so you can get a response. I just want to be very, uh, very respectful of your time and the time of the panelists. Uh, so, Fide, do you have any other questions? Um, no, none at the moment. All right. And so, uh, I do have one, <laughs> and this, and this is for Lisa. Lisa, um, you know, this is going to be an ongoing situation. Um, probably, we are going to have uh, some of the same measures until we get a vaccine or um, uh, an evidence-based uh, treatment, you know, uh, or we have uh, serologic testing in place for all, which is gonna be also very difficult. So um, the, the stress will continue, will, will go on. So is, is there any uh, recommendation for a long-term situation? I believe that we haven't lived uh, uh, situation like this one in many years. You know, there are different events like right. uh, hurricanes and and, uh, and other uh, natural disasters, but I've, I haven't seen anything like this. So is there any uh, long-term, you know, uh, recommendation? Yeah, I, um, I think we've seen this in pockets. We haven't seen it as a community, right? Um, and I think a lot of people are learning a lot about themselves and the pace that they were actually operating at before that really wasn't sustainable. Um, when we turn to trauma-informed care principles, I absolutely believe that that is a way out of this and a way to manage going forward because we are really looking at living in like a toxic stress environment. So the way out of that is resiliency is a protective factor and making sure, again, that you have a routine in which you are prioritizing your self-care. Because if we don't take care of ourselves in crisis, we can't be there for anyone else. Um, but I would encourage people to look through SAMHSA's information on trauma-informed care and really look at how you apply those principles into everything we do encouraging and increasing the voice and control, um, like, like Dr. Rodriguez shared, you know, that people were given the choice of where they go. And that is, you know, a huge important thing that we're doing for people that we might not have thought of doing before, and in fact, put people into very stressful situations unknowingly. Um, but I do think resiliency, um, that resilience wheel, focusing on wellness, uh, taking those breaks, and then looking at infusing those trauma-informed care principles into everything we do um, can help us manage in the long term. Excellent, thank you so much. Next slide, Peter. So um, quickly, we have some publications uh, that have been approved by her side. You have uh, some time, please visit our website. And the, uh, go to the publication uh, list and you'll see the uh, 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 most recent publications on our website. Next slide. Uh, you can also visit our website and find uh, different information on different activities that we're doing uh, to address not only COVID-19, but the uh, uh, all the emerging and current issues affecting uh, public housing residents and public housing primary care grantees. Next slide. Uh, information on HERSA updates. You can uh, find information on funding opportunities and, and HERSA resources and information on upcoming webinars. Next slide. Um, please complete the survey. And uh, this slide has our contact information. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact any of our staff members. 
uh, once again, uh, I am very thankful. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sofia. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. You have been very helpful, very supportive, and this has been a great uh, learning experience for all of us. Thank you, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye, Elizabeth. Great job. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. I hang up now. Yeah.